Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age declares this in matthew 24 12 and because lawlessness will be increased the love of many will grow cold the bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of god's commandments as we read in first john 3 4 whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. At least 10 people are dead, dozens of others injured across separate mass shootings in three major cities. The search for suspects continues tonight in two of those cases, while investigators in each city work to narrow down the motives behind the attacks. Three cities, three deadly mass shootings this 4th of July weekend. A street celebration in Fort Worth, Texas, interrupted by gunfire overnight. Everybody was right here and there was a... They were just popping fireworks, like doing burnouts and stuff, and then there was a lot of gunfire that just started ringing out, and then everybody just started running everywhere. When the bullets stopped, at least three people were killed, eight others injured. Fort Worth investigators say they're searching for suspects in this case. A different city, Baltimore. A few people who cowardly decided to shoot up a big block party celebration for a community. But a familiar scene, gun violence at a July 4th block party Sunday. Two people were fatally shot, over two dozen others injured. Police say they believe there are at least two shooters in this case. One heavily armed gunman was captured by Philadelphia police overnight after seven people were shot, five of them fatally, at multiple locations around the city's southwest side. This male was wearing a bulletproof vest. He also had a scanner and an AR style rifle and a handgun. Two of the shooting victims, children ages two and 13, survived. Officials Tuesday said they are in stable condition. Romans 128 through 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. This is what a nation looks like when they tell God they no longer want or need him. Since America will not recognize God as the creator of all things, follow his commandments and give him the glory that only he deserves. He has left this nation to its own destruction. Proverbs 16.6 6 says, In mercy and truth atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. There is no fear of God in America, and the result is a society full of evildoers. When we are choosing to hold on to sin, rather than repent and change, God will not hear our prayers, as we read in Isaiah 1.15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Proverbs 28.9 says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. America continues to do evil and disregard God's moral law, make up a God of our own liking, and continue to do what is right in our own eyes. America continues to lie, steal, blaspheme God's name, fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography, covet what is not ours, and take human life. Jeremiah 30.12 says, For thus says the Lord, Your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. As a nation, I think America may have reached the point in time where God will no longer hear our prayers because our sin is incurable. 
Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Our desertion of religion and our departure from the founding principle of our nation has occurred very rapidly. It has occurred in my lifetime. I've watched our nation put the gun to its head and get ready to commit suicide. It began with the cultural revolution of the 1960s and has accelerated rapidly since that time. Our public schools have rejected the teaching of Christian morality and prayer within their walls has been declared unconstitutional along with the Ten Commandments. When I was growing up in public schools in Waco, Texas, we began each day with prayer. We began each day with reading from the Bible. We were taught Christian principles. My English reader in senior, as a senior in high school, I had an English reader that was about that thick, and everything in it was stories from the Bible with mor um, uh, morals at the end. And yet it is unthinkable that such a thing could exist today. In like manner, the textbooks of our nation have been cleansed of all references to our Christian heritage. Instead of learning about the essentiality of Christianity to our form of government, our children are being indoctrinated with the so-called principle of the separation of church and state, which is never once mentioned in our Constitution. As a result, most Christians today would be amazed to learn that most of the historical facts about our Christian heritage, facts that were previously contained in American history books, have been erased from the modern textbooks. Take Christopher Columbus, for example. He is vilified in modern textbooks, and no mention is made of the true purpose of his voyage. Here's what he wrote in the log of his ship as he was crossing the Atlantic. It was the Lord who put into my mind, I could feel his hand upon me, the fact that it would be possible to sail from here, Spain, to the Indies. There is no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because he comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. Our Lord Jesus Christ desired to perform a very obvious miracle in the voyage to the Indies to comfort me and the whole people of God. There were 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Nearly all of them were Christians. 24 of them were seminary graduates. Five days after the Declaration was adopted, the Continental Congress voted to use public funds to hire military chaplains. And the Congress also ordered the importation of 20,000 Bibles for the American troops. General George Washington sent out a letter to his regiments which stated, the general hopes and trust that every officer and man will endeavor so to live and act as becomes a Christian soldier defending the dearest rights and liberties of this country. A general who sent out such a letter today would immediately be stripped of his command. Can you imagine the firestorm of criticism that would be occur as a result of such a letter? Through all 50 states, all of them, without exception, all 50 states there runs an appeal and reference to God as the creator of our liberties and the preserver of our freedoms. Here's how it's expressed in the Kentucky State Constitution. We, the people of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, grateful to Almighty God for the civil, political, and religious liberties we enjoy, and invoking the continuance of these blessings, do ordain and establish this Constitution. The Constitution of Texas has a similar statement. Humbly invoking the blessings of Almighty God, the people of the state of Texas do ordain and establish this Constitution. The New England Primer, first published in 1690, remained the nation's most popular school textbook for more than 100 years, selling roughly 5 million copies in a nation that only had 6 million people. It was uh, supplanted finally uh, in 1836 by McGuffey's Reader, which uh, uh, was filled with biblical principles and religious instruction. It ultimately sold more than 120 million copies and was recognized in every state as a public school textbook. Almost every one of the 123 colleges and universities established in the United States had Christian origins and purposes. Truth for Christ, Christ and the church. Truth for Christ and the church was the official logo, the official motto 
of Harvard University. And over the years, as our society secularized, that motto was quietly changed. It was changed to veritas, which just simply means truth. Also, students at Harvard University were told this, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. That's what every student had to focus on when they entered Harvard when it was founded. Yale University, founded in 1701, issued this charge to its students, above all, have an eye to the great end of all your studies, which is to obtain the clearest conceptions of divine things and to lead you to a saving knowledge of God in His Son, Jesus Christ. The United States government issued Bibles to all the troops in World War II, which contained the following statement from President Franklin Roosevelt. As Commander-in-Chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout the centuries, men of many faiths and diverse origins have found in the sacred book words of wisdom, counsel, and inspiration. It is a fountain of strength and now, as always, an aid in attaining the highest aspirations of the human soul. And and on the eve of June the 6th, 1944, the eve of the D-Day invasion of Europe, Franklin Roosevelt went on the radio and he read a six and a half minute prayer. Here's an excerpt. This day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization and to set free a suffering humanity. To lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. For the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces, Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. When the World War II monument was dedicated in Washington, D.C. in 2014, it was discovered to the horror of many people that although the entire text of that prayer was supposed to be emblazoned upon that monument. It had been taken off by the Obama, Obama administration. And so, Congress later passed a bill demanding that the prayer be added to the memorial, and this was finally accomplished in 2022, thank God. The words, under God, were not added to the Pledge of Allegiance by Congress until 1954. That's just 69 years ago. And yet today, it is unthinkable that such words would be put into the Pledge of Allegiance. And furthermore, there are people who are working hard now to take them out of the Pledge of Allegiance. In God We Trust was not adopted as our national motto until 1956. And yet, President Obama consistently told his audiences that the national motto of the United States is e pluribus unum, meaning from one many, meant from many one. Both chambers of the House and the Senate at our National Capitol building feature the inscription in God We Trust on their walls. Now, folks. The amazing thing, the absolutely amazing thing, is that this rich Christian heritage of our nation is being ignored or erased today in our schools, both on the public school level and the university level. Take, for example, this horrible book titled A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, a professor at Columbia University, published in 1980. It has become the leftist Bible of American history. It ignores our Christian heritage. It makes villains of our founding fathers. These so-called historians have, may have an overwhelmingly secular, even pagan bias. But the interesting thing is that Jewish leaders in America fully understand the importance of our Christian heritage and have spoken out strongly in behalf of it. Consider, for example, Jeff Jacoby, uh, a, a columnist for the Boston Globe. This is a Christian country. It was founded by Christians and built on broad Christian principles. Threatening? Far from it. It is precisely this Christian uh, country that Jews have known the most peaceful, prosperous, and successful existence in their long history. Consider Don Fetter, a Jewish columnist for the Boston Herald. He wrote, clearly this nation 
religion was established by Christians. As a Jew, I am entirely comfortable with the concept of a Christian America. The choice isn't Christian America or nothing, but Christian America or a neo-pagan, hedonistic, rights without responsibility, anti-family, culture of fear, culture of death America. And that's exactly where we are. And then there is the Orthodox rabbi. Uh, Daniel Lapine of Seattle, Washington, both a prolific author, author and the host of a radio, syndicated radio uh, talk show. In his profound book, America's Re Real War, he wrote, I will argue that America is a religious nation, but I shall go much further than that. America is not just religious, but is rooted in one particular religious tradition. As an Orthodox rabbi, I will make a compelling case for America as a Christian nation and the need for our nation to be based on Judeo-Christian ethics ethics in order to survive. He says, the origins, legal system, ethos, and moral sense of America are entirely Judeo-Christian, which is absolutely denied by the professors in our universities today. Obama, when he became president, said this over and over, we are no longer a Christian nation. You know what? He was certainly, in a sense, true about that. In 1976, 91% of all Americans claim to be Christians. 1976. In 2022, 64%. That is horrendous drop in a very short period of time. And only 23% of those Christians claim to be born again. And worse still, polls show that only 9% of those who call themselves Christians can be classified as having a biblical worldview. That means that most professing Christians in America today are merely just cultural Christians who are Christians in name only. But this sad fact does not negate the historical evidence that our founding fathers established this nation on Christian principles and that those principles will serve as the basis of our constitutional structure and laws. The problem, of course, is that increasingly today, our, form of, our, our society and government are becoming dominated by secularists who are determined to cut America away from its Judeo-Christian foundation. They have a classic European-style humanistic worldview that despises Christianity, despises capitalism, and the result is that freedom is endangered. We have become a secular pagan society devoid of values that contribute to virtue and civility and the amazing thing that has happened so fast. The hope we have always had about the future has dissipated because we are now a nation that has forgotten God, a nation that has forgotten God. When Alexander Solzhenitsyn came to this nation after he was kicked out of the Soviet Union, he went to Harvard University to speak and they received him as a conquering hero. And when he finished his speech, he had been booed throughout, and he left a pariah. You know why? Because he said, America is on the same track as Russia. He said, I asked my forefathers over and over, why did we suffer 70 years under Stalin, 70 years under communism? And the answer was always the same, he said. We forgot God. And he said, that's exactly where America is today. And that was back in the 1970s. You are forgetting about God. And the result is that we are a deeply divided, fractured nation. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew? A nation divided against itself cannot stand. As I said before, our rapid decline began with the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. It's resulted in an epidemic of immorality and violence. We now spend more money each year on gambling than we do on food. We have murdered 63 million babies since 1973 in the name of freedom of choice for women. We're actively promoting all forms of sexual perversion. And although we constitute only 5% of the world's population, we consume over 50% of all the illegal drugs in the world. And through our immoral, violent, and blasphemous TV programs and movies, we have become the moral polluter of planet Earth. God has raised up prophetic voices like Dave Wilkerson to call us to repentance, and when we have failed to respond, He has stricken us with remedial judgments like the 9-11 attacks and Hurricane Katrina, but our response has been one of patriotism instead of repentance. We have cried out, God bless America, when we should have been praying, America bless God. 
There are several things that are desperately needed in our nation today. First, we need to remind ourselves that all of our blessings, all of them, have come from God and not from ourselves. Second, we need to repent of forgetting about God and rejecting His Word. Third, we need uh, pastors with the courage of Jeremiah, the courage to proclaim the unpopular message that we are a nation in rebellion against God and a nation that needs to repent. And fourth, we need the Christians with the courage of Daniel determined to live Christian lives in the midst of increasing spiritual darkness. Instead, we find even evangelical churches all across this nation getting in bed with the world, trying to please the world instead of pleasing God. One of the Jeremiah pastors in our nation today is this man, Kevin Shrum, pastor of the Inglewood Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Here is what he had to say in the spring of 2014 in a sermon entitled, The Truth About Post-Christian America. The slippery slope of morality has now become a proverbial landslide of moral morass. What seemed to be a slow decline has now exponentially accelerated. The parading and applauding of all things unbiblical and immoral has reached its zenith on the shoulders of the autonomous self, where me, myself, and I are the arbiters of all things truthful and spiritual. Gone is any reference to transcendent authority. How does one live as a Christian in an era where same-sex marriage is now the norm, where homosexuality is openly celebrated, where hypocrisy in the church is consistently exposed, where atheism is not just an alternative intellectual opinion, but a hostile enemy, where Christianity is viewed as the enemy and not the founder and friend of America, and where the spiritual shallowness of many Christians, especially evangelical Christians, is being exposed for what it is, an Americanized version of cultural Christianity that is not authentic, genuine, or biblically orthodox. Oh, my friends, there is some good news in the midst of all this, believe it or not. There really is some good news. And the good news is, there's both good news and bad news. <laughs> the bad news is that we're on the verge of national suicide. The, the good news is that this decline of Christianity, this terrible decline, uh, this uh, outbreak that we have now of immorality and violence is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We're told in Matthew 24, Jesus said He would return at a time when society was once again as violent and immoral as it was in the days of Noah. And my friends, we have arrived. We are in a world and a society that is out of control. But let us face the future with hope. Our nation may be doomed, but the prophetic scriptures reveal that Christians have a fabulous future to look forward to. Keep in mind that God is on His throne. God is in control. Even in the midst of all this terrible stuff we see on the news today, God has the wisdom and He has the power to orchestrate all the evil of mankind to the triumph of His Son. So look forward to that glorious day when Jesus will return in majesty and glory to reign over all the world. And with that thought in mind, all I have to add is Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, 
But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.